During the Second World War, the Allies got a taste of the future, and that future would be in intermediate cartridges. The United States was using 30-06, and the Soviet Union was using 7.62 by 54R, the Brits 303 Brit, you get the idea. But the Germans fielded the 8mm Kurtz cartridge and they coupled it with the STG 44, amongst other firearms. And yeah, the world was pretty much surprised by the results. The Russians, when they came across the STG 44 and the 8mm Kurtz cartridge, they immediately started to work on their own intermediate cartridge during the Second World War, and immediately after the war, they, they fielded it. And it was known as the M43 ball round, or what we call 762 by 39 Now, I want to talk about something that's new, relatively speaking, to the U.S. commercial market. It's not new to hand loaders, and it's not new to those of us who use boutique ammunition that used to pay a buck fifty or two bucks around for it, but what I'm going to talk about today is subsonic 762 by 39. I'll orientate the box right <laughs> so that it's actually legible. This is imported by KVAR. It's available through KVAR. That's where we buy it. And it is a 196 grain bullet that's traveling just under the speed of sound, depending on atmospheric conditions, elevation, things like that. And we'll get more into that in this video and others. This is going to be a multi-part series about the 7.62x39 subsonic cartridge. We're going to compare it to the 300 Blackout. So, immediately after the Second World War, the Russians went to the M43 ball cartridge, the SKS carbine, the AK-47, used the 7.62x39, which in its military loading that we have here, we have some Tula with 122 grain bullet, I believe, and we also have some Golden Tiger with 124 grain bullet, but it's pushing that bullet right around 2,300 feet per second. The subsonic brown bear ammunition that KVAR is bringing in is pushing that 196 grain bullet right around 1,100 feet per second, 1,150. We've gotten different data, and we'll show you some of that in this video, but it's pushing it right at that threshold, that velocity threshold of just being subsonic. So during the 1960s, the Soviets wanted to suppress their AKs. Now the rifle I have here is a Kyber Pass, if you will, build from Definitive Arms. I had Chase make this rifle for me. Uh, the parts kit has a serial number that's uh, actually manufactured date on the trunnion that's my wife's birth year, so I really wanted it. And uh, has a triangle folder, just a beautiful rifle, but it doesn't really represent any factory offering that was made by any of the major arsenals. But anyway, um, I love this DA rifle, but I've set it up to replicate what would be the PBS-1 suppressor and a rifle set up to use the PBS-1 suppressor. So what was a PBS-1 suppressor? 1960s, the Soviets were working on a subsonic 7.62x39 cartridge for themselves. They came up with what we call the PBS-1 suppressor. Now I'm pointing to this one as if it were a PBS-1 suppressor, but it is not. This is a Wolverine sold by Dead Air Silencers. It is made right here in the United States. It uses modern baffle technology where the original 1960s era uh, PBS-1 used a big, thick, rubber wipe. It was a two-chamber arrangement with a big thick rubber wipe that needed to be replaced every 20 to 25 rounds fired. Um, this is a modern baffle technology can and it's designed to work with AK rifles. But while this can's been on the market for a while, we did a video on this can quite some time ago, Subsonic 7.62x39 was really only available to hand loaders and again people willing to pay a buck fifty two bucks a round for boutique ammunition that may or may not be in stock. KVAR changed the game by bringing in this brown bear stuff, and it's really affordable. And it's available. We're ordering it right off the KVAR website and getting it within a week or so. So what the Russians also did, when they developed the PBS-1, the subsonic cartridge to go along with it, they developed a rear sight that most people, myself included, don't really understand how it works. It has a series of cams and elevation adjustments, windage adjustment like an RB, RPK back here, and then you have cams for elevation adjustment here. But in theory, what this rear sight was intended to do was to allow the soldier, well, wouldn't really be a soldier, it'd be a Spetsnaz operator, special operations guy, or the KGB, somebody like that. Uh, this was never intended, this arrangement was never intended for uh, frontline troops, but it would allow the operator to switch between supersonic and subsonic loads and calibrate 
their site accordingly, all right? So what we're gonna do here for you this afternoon is do some shooting with the subsonic 7.62x39 Brown Bear, and we're gonna compare it to its supersonic counterparts. We're gonna put it on the sound meter. We're gonna get some velocity data. And then in another video, we're gonna do a deep dive into this versus the 300 Blackout, which is the most popular caliber in the United States right now for a cartridge similar to this, which is a 30 caliber bullet pressed into a 5.56 case, and it gives similar ballistic performance. But how similar are they? That's what we're gonna explore in this series of videos. All right, let's start off by shooting some supersonic ammunition using the Wolverine Dead Air. Uh, or the, the Dead Air Silencer Wolverine is the brand, or I'm sorry, the model, <laughs> and my definitive arms rifle. We have some magazines out here you haven't seen before on the channel that me and Jason have been using. Uh, they're Unity magazines. Uh, they're imported. Uh, I'm, I'm using ones with the windows, but they have a bolt hold open follower in them, and they're user serviceable. They're polymer. They have metal reinforcement on both locking lug points. And we're really interested in them, and we're gonna be testing them extensively. We've spray painted this one white on the bottom because this is the one we're gonna use the most. We're gonna see how well that bolt hold open works. As you can see, it's a piece of metal, maybe even aluminum, molded into the polymer follower. So we're gonna test these magazines and see how they hold up. They're really nice magazines. They seem to be durable, and the price certainly can't be beat. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and shoot the Tula which is the supersonic stuff. Now I'm gonna set my PBS-1 sight to its supersonic setting, so I have the drums pulled out and it's set to 100 meters. I'm gonna go ahead, charge the rifle. We have a challenge target down at 100 meters. It's an Ipsic kill zone target. I'm just gonna dead hold this guy. All right, you can see how that bolt hold locks, or that bolt hold works. When you drop the magazine out, of course, the bolt drops home. All right, so now what I'm gonna do, and I talked to Mike Pappas from Dead Air Silencers. He has a PBS-1 rear sight. Uh, these things are not all that common. You'll find them online. They're probably gonna dry up when this video hits, <laughs> but you can find them on eBay, places like that. And when I got this one, I wanted to say I paid 90 bucks for it. Um, nobody really knows. I scoured the forums and YouTube and I found one video in Russian that explained the usage of the rear sight. I couldn't understand what was being said and I couldn't find anybody to translate it for me and even Mike uh, and I joked like we don't know how to use it but we just tinker with it and we figured out our own settings. So for 100 yards I'm going to go ahead and just pull this back to its BZO setting which is um, up to 300 meters from 1 to 300 meter combat sight setting and now I'm going to grab some of the subsonics and I'm gonna do the exact same hold at 100 yards. And I sh should still get center of mass hits. Very, very pleasant shooting. And um, yeah, that is so cool. Now I've shot subsonic ammunition before here on the channel. Uh, I actually have a video about that. It's some boutique ammo. I think, uh, I forget the name of the company that manufactured it, but I'll try to find the video and put a little card up there for you so you guys can go watch that video about some of the boutique ammo. But this stuff is affordable, available, and it's really good if you have a suppressed AK. What happens if you don't have a suppressed AK and you just want to shoot this through your AK for some reason? Let's find out. If you haven't already, check out Rob Ski's video at AK Operators Union. He already published a video on his testing with the 7.62x39 Brown Bear subsonic ammunition, and it's worth a watch. But while I was watching his video, something I thought was pretty interesting. He was running OSS silencers on the rifles he was testing. There's something unique about OSS silencers. They're practically zero back pressure. And what does that mean? Typically when you suppress a gun, 
the suppressor will cause the guns to be severely overgassed and a lot of propellant gases will also come back down the bore. The OSS is a flow through and that means you have very little overpressure, if any at all, using an OSS can. And I thought that was curious because the guns were working. And I thought to myself, well, if they're working with an OSS can, it would stand to reason that these subsonic loads will cycle an AK without a silencer on them. Because you would think, at least I thought until I watched Rob's video and before I had a chance to play with the ammunition, it would require a suppressor being present to create that overgas situation to give the gun enough gas to operate because we're working with much lower gas pressures. So I have a full magazine with subsonics. This is a standard unmodified Vepr with the exception that it has an OSS mu a muzzle device on it. You go ahead and make sure that that magazine's locked into place in the Vepr. Go ahead and chamber around. And now, get rid of that OSS. Let's see if this thing's gonna cycle. Now at zero to the 100, I'm just gonna leave it at 100. I'm gonna hold at the target's face and see if I hit the thing or not and if the gun cycles. Kicked one out. <laughs> it's kicking them out. They're only making it maybe half the distance of a standard full power 762 by 39. But it's running this Vepr just fine. and even locked open. That surprises me. But like I said, I suspected that because of Rob's video. Now, I used a full magazine because a full magazine is gonna put a lot of force upwards on that bolt carrier. And uh, that didn't seem to make any difference whatsoever. That's pretty darn interesting, all right? Now, would I recommend going out and buying subsonics to shoot them? I guess if you don't have a suppressor, there's really not much point in it, but apparently it works the AK. Now it may not work all rifles. We've not conducted an extensive test by any means. You watch the only test we've conducted so far. Let's see that magazine's empty. This magazine we only partially loaded in case a full magazine prevented the gun from working, but that wasn't the case. We have a full 30 rounds here and we have a 762 by 39 AR, which is direct gas impingement. Let's go ahead and it has a muzzle device on it for a suppressor, but no can present. And let's see if this guy works. Nope. So it kicked the spent case out, but it didn't pick one up. All right, I'm getting click no bang or something. Let's try it, see if it picked one up. Nope. <laughs> nope. Nope. All right, so let's go to partially full magazine. This one only has about 10 rounds in it. And let's see if reducing that upward pressure from the follower and magazine spring allows the direct gas impingement rifle to work. Doesn't seem that's going to work.
you get the idea. Uh, we fired six shots. The average velocity was 1,119 feet per second. We had a highest velocity of 1,157 feet per second. We had a low velocity of 1057. We had an extreme spread of 100, a standard deviation of 37.6, and that was for six shots fired. We can take a look at the velocities from zero to 35 yards. At 35 yards on shot five of six, uh, it, at the muzzle it was 1137. At 35 yards, it was still doing 1107 feet per second. So if we jump over to here for our series one, we can see, let's see. Oh, here we go. All right, so we have an average of 562 foot-pounds of energy, all right, and an average power factor of 218.5 for those of you that are interested. So as I showed earlier in the video, this rear PBS-1 sight is capable of adjusting for supersonic loads and subsonic loads. Now, I don't know what the original Soviet subsonic loads were like and how close these brown bear loads are in terms of ballistics performance, bullet velocity, things like that. But what I do know is through tinkering, I figured out what my settings are for my known distance range out here at the Mack Ranch. So we have a target out at 250 yards. It's a challenge man-sized target. And we've got some of the subsonic loads in here. I have my drums set for the subsonic setting for 200 meters. Guess I had one in the pipe already. And we are going to see if I can dead hold, because we don't have very much wind out here today, surprisingly, and score some hits at 250 yards with these subsonic loads. Now I can hear a crack down range. That last shot just broke the sound barrier. Again, these loads are riding that ragged edge. And right now it's 65 degrees here or so. You guys get the idea. The gun really is surprisingly quiet. Now, OSHA tells us that we're only supposed to be um, exposed to a gunshot that's suppressed, that's below 140 decibels once every 24 hour period. But this is the first time I fired it without ears on today. I just wanna hear what this one shot sounds like at 250 yards with no hearing protection. Okay, so let me describe this to you guys because these mics don't actually pick things up very well. I could hear the bolt clicking, the mechanism of this rifle clicking. It's like a click, click. I don't really hear a gun, gunshot per se. All I hear is the bolt go click, click. It sounds like something tapping the top cover to me. And then I hear the bullet hitting the steel plate downrange, which is not quite as loud as the mechanical action of the gun. But as far as the gunshot, there really isn't much of a gunshot at all. That's really, really cool. Let's go ahead and get some meter data now. I have five rounds loaded of the subsonic ammunition into the Definitive Arms Kuiper Pass rifle. Have the Dead Air Wolverine on the end of the barrel there. We are 1.6 meters off the ground. One meter left of the muzzle is our Brulucare pressure sensor. I'm gonna go ahead and get it ready to record. Okay, that first shot is 136.6 decibels. I'm also running my little 
Kestrel over here, and right now it's actually 68 degrees where we're at. Shot two. 132.4 decibels. Shot three. I could hear a rolling crack down range, but it was only 130.2 decibels. Even though that bullet broke the sound barrier down range, I could hear a rolling crack. It, uh, it's still quite quiet here. Now that one was louder, 142.5 decibels. We see an extreme spread in velocity and we're seeing quite a jump in sound. And I also heard a rolling crack down range. Sixty-seven degrees outside. One hundred and thirty point six. Now that's actually a really good number. All right, so that's at the muzzle. Now let's switch it up and move that pressure sensor over to where it's six inches off the shooter's right ear. That's the new military standard. We now have the pressure sensor set up so it's six inches off my right ear. This is the new mil spec testing standard that came out of the CSAS program that the military is currently using. So I'm going to go ahead and reset the meter. One hundred and thirty seven flat. One thirty four point eight. One thirty six point nine. One thirty four flat. and 136.2. Good numbers at the shooter's ear. Very good numbers. This time, guys, we have a Arsenal pistol, 762 by 39 with a milled receiver and an eight and a half inch barrel. We have a Griffin Armament Revolution 9 suppressor on here. It's a pistol, nine millimeter pistol can, but we have a blast shield installed. All right, we have five rounds of the subsonic brown barrel, 196 grain. Let's go ahead and charge the rifle, get it ready. Go ahead, we have a series two set up. Let's start the recording. Let's see what we get. Nine hundred and fifty three feet per second on the first shot. Nine hundred and seventy two feet per second. I don't think it picked that one up. 
All right. So let's go ahead and stop that. And let's see. So we have a kinetic energy of 364 foot-pounds of energy. Let's jump out and take a look at the series. So, let's see. All things considered here on series two, we have an average velocity of 925 feet per second. The highest velocity being 972, the lowest being 882, an extreme spread of 90. Standard deviation of 37.2 of five shots fired. So as you can see, when you go from a 16 inch barrel to an eight inch barrel, roughly half that barrel length, that's the difference you can expect in, the term, in terms of the performance of the cartridge. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. This is just the first video in a series of videos that we plan to compare the 762 by 39 subsonic brown bear ammunition to 300 blackout. This rifle, is extremely pleasant to shoot, but we learned something out here today. If you listen to the gun when I run the action, the loudest part it seems to be when you're firing the gun is the action of the gun itself cycling. Listen to the stock ring. You can hear that stock ringing. If I hold on to the stock, notice the difference? And I could really tell that. Uh, if I was going to put this can on another rifle with a wood stock, it would probably be even more quiet to the shooter's ear. But when I stabilize it with my cheek, this gun, both Jason and I agree, is very pleasant to the ear to shoot. Doesn't necessarily mean it's hearing safe, though. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. There will be more coming in the future. If you guys have any questions about anything you've seen in this video, you can ask those questions down below. Also, I would ask that you go by and check out AK Operators Union's channel and check out his videos that are about the 762 by 39 subsonic ammunition. I'm sure he has more videos planned as well. If you'd like to support us directly here at the Military Arms Channel, we are supported by you, our viewers. There is a link down below to Patreon. Follow that link and check out some of the tier levels and consider becoming part of our Patreon family. And please swing by and check us out at coppercustom.com. Thanks for 11 years of support and we'll talk to you guys soon.